Hi, my name is Richard Baxter, and it's such a pleasure to be speaking to the Talk Tools team on an overview of Essential Tots concepts. A few disclosures. I am the owner of the Alabama Tongue Tie Center in Birmingham, Alabama. I did write the book Tongue Tied with a team of specialists, and we do receive royalties from the sale. All those royalties are donated to charity. I also have an advanced live patient course at our office and an online comprehensive course called Tongue Tied Academy and the light version uh, for therapists. Both those courses also, all the fees are donated to charity. So I have no interest in any dental or laser companies. I've not received funding or honoraria from any companies. Uh, we do have a few new translations of the book uh, in case you weren't aware of these, but uh, we have English. And so that one's available on Amazon. Uh, French and Spanish are as well. Um, and we can get the English ebook version for free if you want to at our website, tongtieal.com slash professionals. Uh, so we have English, Spanish, French, Polish, Danish, and then Chinese is our latest. Um, we also have Tongue Tied Academy. This is what uh, it took about a year to write the script, and then we filmed it during COVID. This is what we did in our COVID project. Um, but it's uh, 25 hours for the full version. It's for providers to learn the A to Z of tongue ties. And then we have the therapist version. Uh, it's called Tongue Tied Academy Light. It's 13 hours. Um, I have a coupon code at the end if you're interested. And what we do with the money. Uh, so we have a health center in Nepal. We've done a couple of those. Uh, lots of water wells all over sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia. And then some uh, projects with human trafficking and other things too. So uh, we definitely enjoy uh, giving back uh, locally in Alabama and throughout the uh, world as well. So here's our family. as my wife, Tara, uh, who's a nurse practitioner. And then our three girls, um, Hannah, Noel, and Molly. Uh, the twins right here is how we got in the whole uh, mess in the first place. Uh, that's Noel, there's Hannah, and then here's Molly. So here's where I'm coming to you live today from. This is our dental office, Shelby Pediatric Dentistry, just south of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, we have a playground outside. We have a lot of fun. And tongue ties started taking over our office. And so in 2018, we formed the Alabama Tongue Tie Center. We've had patients from all over the world, all over the country. Uh, I've been privileged to treat them and their families. So basically, we uh, ask mom what's going on. Um, we'll take a look and see, uh, examine the child and then release if indicated. And so today we're gonna to talk about all those steps and how to do it um, the best possible way and what therapists in particular uh, can uh, learn about this emerging field. So a couple quotes to start us off. Um, you've probably heard one or two of these before, but uh, half of what we're gonna teach you is right, half, sorry, half of what we teach you is wrong and half is right. Our problem is we don't know which half is which. This is a famous quote from a previous Harvard Medical School dean uh, basically talking about medical education. We uh, do the best we know, or dental education, or speech, or feeding therapy education. Everyone does the best they can at the time, but as time goes on, what you realize is a lot of the stuff you're taught is actually not correct or uh, just incomplete. And so that's kind of what um, is going on here, because I think ASHA, official position statement from ASHA, is that, oh, tongue ties don't cause problems, or they might interfere with speech problems in uh, certain circumstances, but most don't. Um, and so that's kind of goes along with the pediatricians. They say, oh, tongue ties rarely cause problems and often it'll stretch out and that kind of stuff, which unfortunately is not true. From the forward of tongue tied, Rajiv uh, wrote that he put in this quote. Um, it says, your eyes do not see what your mind does not know. And once you've seen it, it's impossible to unsee. And so today you're going to get the knowledge and a lot of you already have the knowledge or else you're probably not taking this TOTS course. But uh, maybe for some of you, this is your first time diving deep into the world of tethered oral tissues or TOTS. And so um, hopefully now that your mind does know it, your eyes will see it. And unfortunately, you can't unsee it. So I apologize about that. I uh, may have just wrecked uh, your career here. You're going to see tongue ties. Like, oh, my gosh, there's tongue tie everywhere. But does that mean we treat every tongue tie or um, restricted tongue? Sometimes, sometimes not. It depends if it's causing a problem. So let's dive in. A few pearls. So we always work with a team approach to care, so we don't just release it and then have no therapist, for example, or um, no body work and that kind of stuff. So you want to work, the more team members, the better. All proper diagnoses start with a proper history. So if I just see a picture, I can't tell you whether that's a tongue tie or not. I mean, if it's to the tip, like it's probably a tongue tie. But um, if it's less obvious, like a posterior tongue tie, I don't know unless I know what the symptoms it's causing. So misdiagnosis comes from not listening or not examining fully. And so often we'll have you know, a child in speech therapy for maybe five or 10 years and no one picked up that they had a pretty restricted tongue um, that I think is fairly obvious, but if it's not examined properly or fully, then it may not be picked up and then they're just taught to compensate. 
So if I was listening to mom's story without interrupting, empathize. It's easy, all three of my girls and I had a tongue tie. That's often dad's fault. That's just a side note. Like most things are dad's fault, right? Um, we review all the symptoms systematically one by one and we take notes. Always examine properly with gloves and tools as needed. So we use a mouth prop. I can show you where to buy those. Symptoms and function are more important than the appearance. You'll hear me say that just a few times today um, because that's one of the biggest keys uh, to figuring this whole um, TOTS thing out. We always image all areas of concern, so take lots of pictures. We discuss the findings with parents and make a plan. And then we always release fully. We don't just cut it halfway uh, and precisely in the right place if indicated. Or for you guys, refer to a knowledgeable provider in your area. We always follow up at one week minimum and then more often as needed. So if you skip any of these steps, if you don't get a proper history, if you don't get a proper exam, if you're not you know, talking about risk and benefits right, um, if you don't realize that symptoms and function are more important than the appearance, if you're not getting a full release and you're not following up and there's no team approach, you can't expect it to work and you can't expect it to get the results that you'll see in these case studies and stuff. So you have, you have to make sure that all those things are there. And then if they are all there, very um, often, almost all the time, you'll get some good result after, out of the release. So from babies to kids, we always check from behind like this. So mom can see, I can see, come from behind, you can see the baby. Um, if you don't check from behind, you'll probably miss a good portion of tongue and lip ties. Just having the child or the baby stick the tongue out is the worst test to determine the presence of a tongue tie. Elevation or lifting the tongue is a much better test. Um, so again, child we can see down like this, uh, we'll get a good look in there and we use a mouth prop. So this is called a molt mouth prop. It's a 3.5 inch molt mouth prop. You can get one on eBay for about four or five dollars. So uh, it is a spectrum of lip restrictions. So one of the things I hope you appreciate today, these are all babies, obviously, there's no teeth, but uh, this is probably the most minimal lip tie I've ever seen. This is the tightest. So some pediatricians say, oh, all babies have a lip tie or it all looks like a lip tie, but there's no true lip ties. But it depends on a few different factors. So it's not just looking at where it inserts. See, most of these are at the bottom um, of the gum ridge, but like this one, for example, is not really blanching when you lift up on it. So if it's not causing a problem for that individual baby, we might leave it. If it is causing a problem, then fix it. So if it ain't folk, uh, if it don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but if it is broke, it's it's worth fixing. So this one's blanching or turning white. So that's one of the key indicators. If you see it notching the bone, that's another key indicator. Sometimes it's corded. There's like really thick, super thick. This one's really tight. The lip can't flip up to the nostril. There's also a little dimple up here on the outside of the upper lip. Um, so all those things. And then this one's just like super tight. I mean, there's there's no mobility whatsoever in that bottom right picture. The tongue, likewise, is also a spectrum of restriction. So not just class one, two, three, four, it's really anywhere from all the way to the tip to barely visible or palpable. And so what's interesting is even this one down here for that individual patient was causing problems. How do I know? Well, they had lots of problems. They drove probably three hours to see us and then we fixed it and then it got better afterward. So we know it, it helped. Um, but anyway, it doesn't take much imagination to see how that top left one could impact nursing or later on speech, solid feeding, sleeping, dental development, posture, breathing, all kinds of stuff. Um, but it does, you know, take a little bit of imagination to see, okay, if the middle portion of the tongue or the back of the tongue is restricted, even though the front's not, so the child or baby can stick the tongue out, just that little bit for some infants or children or even adults is too tight. Right, so we're going to talk about how to figure out who to treat and who not to treat. So sometimes it's real thin, sometimes it's to the tip, sometimes it's further back. What do all these have in common? That they're restricted to some degree for that individual patient. These two in the upper right here, really thick. Why are they so thick? Someone cut them previously. They just clipped it halfway, probably an ENT or a pediatrician, maybe a neonatologist at the hospital. And unfortunately, they didn't get it all. So this can cause issues later on with speech, feeding, and sleep or it can cause issues, and for these babies it was, that's why they came to see us, with nursing or bottle feeding, colicky, reflux, all that kind of stuff. So this is the same uh, patient right here. This is one patient. If you just peek in there just a little bit, you see there's a little something, a little tenting right there. Um, when you lift up on it more, you can see, okay, now there's some fascia bunching together, right? The, the connective tissue, the stuff underneath the mucosa, it's called fascia. When you pull up with two fingers from behind, you can really see, it. okay, now there's a definite string there. And we release that right in the middle and you get a nice diamond shape. 
And then the often the baby nurses or bottle feeds or whatever, um, you know, better within like a day or two. Um, so here's a child, uh, very similar. So notice here, look at the teeth. That's a telltale sign when those incisors are pulling inward. Something's got to be pulling them in. So what is it most of the time? Well, it's a restricted tongue. And this one's not obvious. This child may be on your caseload, and you're like, why have we been in speech therapy for six years, still trying to get R, and he's a picky eater and a slow eater and has dark circles under his eyes and has ADHD. You're probably thinking of little Johnny right now. And you look in there, and there's nothing there. But when you, you know, peel it up, you see a little bit pop up, and then you pull with two fingers. Oh, my word. Like, there's some restriction there. That might only be, what, 25% restricted, right? It's not to the tip. Um, but for Johnny, that might be too tight. In fact, this individual child was a hygiene check, so we were checking them for the cavities, and it was fairly tight, so I asked mom, hey, mom, any speech, feeding, or sleep issues? She said, nope, he's good. So okay, well, if you do have any in the future, let us know. So we did not do anything for this child. But for the other ones today, you'll see oh, yeah, almost all these, they came to us for tongue tie reasons, so we fixed them. Obviously, this one, very tight, perfect articulation. I don't have to tell you guys this. I'm not a speech therapist, but um, articulation is not all there is to speech. So often there's fluency, so stuttering. There's um, uh, basically like how easy is it to talk? How much effort is it to talk? Um, so this person, like even though their articulation was good, it took them lots of effort to talk. They got tired when talking. People get jaw fatigue, get tired when singing. I lift up here about 50%. This one lifts up a little bit more. This one over here, you know, has great elevation, but this patient was nonverbal. Now, they were also autistic, right? So with our kids on the spectrum, Down syndrome, premature babies, everything gets blamed on that, right? Oh, he can't talk, he's autistic. But there's lots of autistic patients that do talk uh, or patients with Down syndrome that, you know, do other things, but they eat well and sleep well and others that don't. So you can have a restricted tongue and have Down syndrome. You can have a restricted tongue and have autism, right? And when we treat those patients on the spectrum, often many things improve, Certainly some do not, right? They are just from the autism, but a lot of things do improve where patients realize and their families realize it was worth it. But notice this one right here. See how the floor of the mouth is lifting up a lot? And so that's lifting up pretty high. So if you were to hold that down, I'll show you later that move. Um, but basically his true mobility is probably about there. So we did treat this one. Came back the next week talking. He had several new words. Said mama for the first time. Was sleeping so well. Mom thought he was dead. All those kinds of things. Here's some obvious lip ties, so it means some cavities on there. This one's got a dog leg on it, blanching the tissue, a large diastema. So to treat this, you have to get the whole thing out. If you just cut it once like that, it will not work. You have to get the whole thing out to see the benefits and also to get that gap to close up. Uh, but again, symptoms and function are more important than appearance. And then elevation, so lifting the tongue is much more important than sticking the tongue out. So if I hear like, oh, the pediatrician said they can stick their tongue out, they're fine. We hear that like almost every day. That's, that's not the test. <laughs> um, so a commonly uh, held myth or belief uh, rather in pediatric dental circles, orthodontic circles, is that if you treat the lip tie before the primary, sorry, the uh, adult canines are in around 11 years old, if you do the lip tie before then, you're going to get scar tissue and then the gap won't close up. Unfortunately, it's not true, um, or fortunately, however you want to look at it. So we treat it in little kids or babies. We often do see that gap closed up. So we looked at all our patients for a three-year period and found uh, there about 200 patients we did with teeth. A lot of them were babies who so didn't have teeth. 109, we got them to follow up. 94.5% of the patients, the width decreased. Half with CO2 laser, half with a diode laser. 13 had permanent teeth. 96 had primary teeth, so most with baby teeth. And we just got it published in International Orthodontics. So... Next time you hear someone say, oh, don't do the lip tie, it causes scar tissue, you can point them to this article, um, and it does close up. Here's a few pictures. This is with a diode laser. See how it's kind of like charred looking, but he healed beautifully, and then the gap closed up a good bit, right? This one's with CO2 laser. It's just like a cleaner cut. Um, this one's also a CO2 laser, so it just kind of disappears. And then obviously the gap closed up. And here's the article. Dr. Zaghi and I worked on this. Um, and then here's an 11-year-old. We did his. You know, his teeth are very you know, much in. His canines were not in yet. We released it with a CO2 laser, and then the gap closed up, saved him $6,000. So mom was happy, um, you know, much uh, improved, and he can clean the teeth better, and you know, he can get other improvements as well. 
So how do we determine who to treat, right? It's not just about the, the appearance. It's not just about the feel of the tissue. It's about what symptoms is it causing. So here's our baby form. Dr. Cotwell came up with the first version of this, and we changed it just a little bit. On the top is the baby symptoms. On the bottom is the mom's symptoms. Here's the sneaky thing I did, though. A lot of parents would come to us and say, oh, he's just got a lip tie because it's more obvious than maybe lactation or a friend or Google told them that they had a lip tie. Well, these are the lip tie symptoms on the left. Or sorry, on the right. On the left, these are more the tongue tie symptoms. Okay, so the lip tie stuff is like the seal issues. The tongue tie stuff is the tongue is the motor. It's doing the work. So the shallow latch, falling asleep, popping off and on the nipple, gagging, choking, coughing. And none of these are normal. They're common, but common does not mean normal, right? So poor or slow weight gain doesn't have to be, right? That's the one check mark the pediatricians care about. If they're gaining weight, they're fine. If they're not gaining weight, okay, then it might be a problem. But for us, that's just one of many check marks. It's an important one, certainly, but often moms be pumping and triple feeding to get the weight up on the baby. Hiccups a lot, and what's interesting is in utero hiccups. If they have like tons of in utero hiccups, like several times a day, Often there's a dysfunctional swallow from the restricted tongue, and then they come out, they hiccup, hiccup, hiccup. We do the procedure and it stops or goes away. Gumming or chewing the nipple, passy falls out, snoring, noisy breathing, short sleeping, waking up a lot, restless sleeping, then they always seem hungry. And those are more of the tongue tie things. The lip tie stuff is the seal, so the lip curls under, the clicking or smacking noises, sucking blisters, colic. Oh, that's terrible. Colic is not normal. It is a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. It's actually a diagnosis of exclusion. So in order to give that diagnosis to a baby, you have to have gone through every possibility that it could be something else. And almost always, they never check for lip or tongue tie. But colic, yeah, if you call a baby, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, there's something going on. Because if they have a poor seal, they're swallowing air. You hear that clicking or smacking noise. And then the air gets in the belly, has to go somewhere. So it comes up as reflux or spit up. It goes down as toots, as gas. And while it's in that rumbles around, really uncomfortable, colic, right? Milk leaks out of the mouth, the nose sounds congested, they're frustrated, and then constipation or like weird stools. We always ask mom how they're doing mentally or emotionally because most patients that come see us are majorly on the struggle bus. They have uh, nipple distortion, uh, lipstick shape, nipple damage, blistered, cut nipples. Often the pain is really bad, like a seven. Ones that are more obvious, sorry, less obvious are often more painful. So like a posterior, like not obvious tongue tie, so less than 50% of the way to the tip would be a posterior tongue tie. Most of the time, those ones are really painful. Sometimes a to the tip tongue tie is painful, I have an example later, um, but most of the time it's uh, not as painful. And then um, postpartum depression is a real thing. It's very common. Uh, it's about one in seven moms, but with our patients, yeah, it's, it's very common. Uh, it just depends if they're uh, being truthful or not in the EPDS10 screening form. Um, poor breast drainage, decreasing milk supply, they often have plug ducts, engorgement mastitis, thrush, nipple shield, and then baby prefers one side over the other. If we see this one right here, we definitely need to get them checked out by a chiropractor or a PT, someone who sees babies a lot. Often there's some torticollis or some tension in the neck or shoulders. So are we just treating reflux and then colic and then spitting up and then nipple pain? Are we just looking at the fruit, right? And just giving them band-aids so they're spitting up, okay. Or they're gassy, here's some uh, gas drops. They're refluxy, here's some uh, Zantac. Oh, sorry, Zantac causes cancer. Uh, let's do some Pepsid. Um, you know, like all these little things, right? Uh, it hurts, here's a nipple shield. They're not getting weight, here's some formula. You're giving them a family pack of Band-Aids. Instead of looking deeper, what's the root cause? Most of the time, there's a tongue tie or lip tie that's at fault. And there's cheek ties too, called buckle ties. Maybe one in 10 babies we treat has those. It's less obvious. Um, that's probably tertiary, but the tongue and lip are the main issues. So I can't go over everything in like one hour on tongue ties, sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, buckle ties do exist. They are a thing. So here's our child form. And so if you work with an older population, not doing infant feeding as much, uh, this would be your form. You can download this on our website. But basically, it's three main areas we look at, speech, feeding, and sleeping, right? And then the history of issues as a baby. So what do they have as a baby? And then like a catch-all called other. So speech, these are the most common issues we see with tongue ties. Not exhaustive, but this is like the greatest hits, okay? Frustration with communication. They're often shy. They're embarrassed. Parents and other people have a hard time understanding them. They have trouble speaking fast, getting words out, trouble with certain sounds. Typically, it's R's, L's, S's, S-H sounds, Z, K, ing. Like all those can be issues. Uh, and there's others too. Uh, speech delay. 
we uh, published the first article in 2020 linking speech delay with a tongue tie. A lot of these kids that are like one, two, three years old and are speech delayed, we release the tongue and most of the time they have new words or, or more babbling or something the same day or the same week. So pretty cool. Stuttering, we've had some crazy results with adults with lifelong stutters in our office crying afterward because one guy said, I, I've been waiting my whole life just to say a sentence without stuttering. And his was not to the tip. It was about halfway. So no one picked it up, and he was about 30. Um, speech hard to understand long sentences. There's been speech therapy for a, a long time. Mumbling or speaking softly. So these kids that are on your caseload that, like, you cannot figure out what's wrong with them, like, why can't they just eat or why can't they just, you know, make a certain sound, check them extra closely for a tongue tie, right? So certainly try therapy first, uh, but it's kind of like the shoelace example. If I had my shoelaces tied together and I wanted to run in the Olympics, I could have an Olympic coach, right? I could have the best speech therapist in the world, but if my two shoelaces are tied together, if my tongue is restricted, I mean, I'm not going to get anywhere. Or I can get a little bit, but I can't run in the Olympics. I won't be thriving, right? Baby talking, and then the eating stuff. So frustration with eating, trouble transition to solids as a baby. They're a slow eater, small appetite, trouble gaining weight. They graze on foods. They're packing their food in their cheeks like a chipmunk. They're picky. Often it's meat and mashed potatoes, right? Not all the time, but maybe 90% of the time it's meat. Um, choking or gagging on foods, spitting out foods, won't try new foods, constipation. If it doesn't start the journey right, if they're not chewing properly, it won't end the journey right. We see tons of kids with constipation improve afterward. Reflux, and then it affects the family dynamics. Like they can't eat out. It's like a struggle every meal time. It takes an hour to eat, that kind of stuff. Sleep. Sleep is critical. Brain development, immune system function, growth and development, like everything's affected by sleep, basically. Attention. So they sleep in weird positions, maybe with their bum up in the air called tripod sleeping. They sleep restlessly. They're just like constantly tossing and turning. They wake up easily and join mom in bed. You know, they're a light sleeper. They'll wet the bed even though they're nine or 10 years old. We've seen a lot of those kids see improvements. They wake up tired, not refreshed. They grind their teeth a lot while they're sleeping. Sleep with their mouth open. They'll snore, snoring. Again, none of these are normal, right? They're common, but they're not normal. Maybe about 30% of kids will snore, but they shouldn't be snoring. There's a, there's a red flag. There's something wrong. Now, obviously, they're gasping for air or stopping breathing. That's really something wrong. Um, other issues, neck or shoulder tension, TMJ issues, headaches, migraines, strong gag reflex, um, thumb sucking or pacifier use. Why do they do that? Well, if their nasopalatine nerve is not stimulated, they will use their thumb, a finger, a passy, something, a blanket to stimulate that so they feel like, ha, ah, like grounded or at peace. Um, strong gag reflex. We talked about mouth breathing or mouth open. Um, basically, if they have a low tongue tone or if they have a tongue tie holding it down, encourages an open mouth posture, which often leads to mouth breathing, which can cause the tonsils to enlarge, um, which causes more mouth breathing, and it's, it's like a vicious cycle. And then it causes snoring. So, But where did it originate with the low tongue posture? Why is the tongue down? Most of the time, it's because the tongue is restricted, like a tongue tie. Ear tubes, they often get lots of ear infections. Um, and then hyperactivity uh, inattention. So why is that? If they're not sleeping well, they'll get hyperactivity. Uh, they'll get misdiagnosed as ADHD or ADD and not pay attention just because they're sleep deprived. Lip tie issues. So again, all these other ones we talked about, all these are mostly tongue tie issues, right? So the tongue ties up here, the lip ties down here. So again, people come in and say, oh, my child has a lip tie and they'll check off like, I mean, literally 20 boxes, okay? And I'm like, hey mom, there's probably a tongue restriction too, right? Um, but the lip tie stuff is trouble brushing the top teeth. The top teeth don't show when they're smiling. It's held down. They have a big gap between the two front teeth. Cavities maybe. Trouble eating from a spoon. Those kids that are flipping the spoon over to get food off, they probably have a lip tie. Trouble with bilabial speech sounds, BP, M, and Ws. Here's our adult form. Very similar to the others. They might get embarrassed or shy, um, stuttering. Their jaw gets tired. Trouble singing, that kind of stuff. Um, feeding issues, uh, only ones that changed from here from the kids is like trouble swallowing pills, maybe choking or gagging on food or water, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, CPAP, uh, poor quality sleep, maybe they need a sleep appliance, and then sleep apnea. Jaw surgery in the past, like I did. Sinus surgery in the past, like I did. Teeth extracted for braces. I had some teeth extract, uh, not premolars, but baby teeth. So, um, and then trouble breathing through the nose. Interestingly enough, when you release a lip tie, it releases the fascia up here in the mid face and people 
most patients report they can breathe easier, like less resistance through their nose. Uh, and then often adults will have like the neck or shoulder tension. So again, for adults, it's mostly sleep and other because they've figured out how to talk. They figured out how to eat. They might have some breathing issues too, but the speech and eating is often figured out by the time they're an adult. Maybe they're 30 or 50 or something come to see us. But often they will have headaches, TMJ issues, um, stress or anxiety, uh, trouble or pain with kissing. Um, they don't hold chiro chiropractic adjustments well. So, um, and then this is our evaluation form. Basically, you can do babies up to adults with this. So we'll look at uh, the lip tie issues, buckle ties. So is it a feel like a speed bump up in the cheek? Is it limiting movement? Um, and then we'll counsel the parents, you know, downsides on buckle ties uh, for babies is it's more sore. So two areas to be sore, lip and tongue versus lip, tongue, and the right and left cheeks. Uh, two more areas you have to stretch, but we don't charge for buckle ties. There's no good research on buckle ties, but um, it does seem like they can limit the seal um, and limit like how wide the baby can open sometimes. Um, for the tongue, Kotlo, uh, one, two, three, or four. Again, I like percentages because then everyone knows what I'm talking about. So if I say it's 75% of the way to the tip versus if I say it's a class three or is it a class two? If you say it's a class one and they're using Carillos, they think it's to the tip. So dentists more use a, a Kotlo scale. So class four would be to the tip. If I've just confused you, just use percentages. It makes it easier on everyone. Um, posterior tongue tie. So what does it feel like? Is it a speed bump? Is it a fence? Is it an Eiffel Tower? Is it thick or thin? Where is it inserting? Functional grading, we'll talk about this in just a second. Is it comp are they compensating? Are they lifting the floor of the mouth up, right? Is it a grade four compensating or it looks like a grade three? Uh, how's their palate? What's their intramolar width? So all these things. Uh, how wide is the child's? So anyway, all those things are helpful to know. And I like just having on one page, keep it simple. So the compensations, we just talked about the floor of the mouth. Um, basically, this is a hidden one. And once uh, Dr. Zaghi and others realized this, uh, we started checking for this on patients. It really explained a lot because like this, like in that earlier picture I showed you, the uh, child with autism, he could lift his tongue up great, but then his whole floor of his mouth was lifting up. So he was restricted. You couldn't really tell. So this patient, see how the floor of the mouth is lifting up right here? And so it looks like in the lift pretty good. When you use a glove finger to hold that down, right behind the incisors, see the tongue now lifts about halfway. Okay, that's his true mobility. So you have to check for the floor of mouth elevation. A lot of patients get most of their elevation out of the floor of their mouth instead of from the tongue. Here's an example of that. So this is a 39-year-old opera singer that came to see us. So um, speech is kind of important for her. It's her main job, right? Um, she's been compensating with her singing. She gets shy in social situations, trouble with sounds, S's and Z's especially. Speech therapy at age 30 as an adult, so about nine years ago. She was bottle fed as a baby. She kind of grazes on food. She has a mouth open, mouth breathing posture. But look at her sleep. Again, the sleep is key. OSA since 2017. This is from earlier this year. Sleeps in weird positions, moves around at night, wakes up easily, poor sleep quality, wakes up tired. She has to use a CPAP, grinds her teeth, mouth open, snoring, like every checkbox, like literally under sleep. Neck tension, TMJ issues, strong gag, reflux, constipation, stress, and then she doesn't hold chiropractic adjustments. So what do we do? Here's her lips. She did have some trouble moving her lips, she reported, with some like bilabial sounds as well. And then she had some issues breathing through her nose. So we said, hey, let's try it. And so we released it, and then she could breathe better through her nose afterward. Just a small release. It was about 30 seconds. Minimal discomfort. It's not that bad. And we just used some like injected lidocaine. So she's not asleep or like sedated or anything. Here's the tongue. So notice, just let her lift on her own. It looks okay. So your patients on your you know patient uh, load right now, you've already checked them for a tongue tie, maybe check them again. They might be lifting up and lifting the floor of their mouth. If you hold a finger down, you can see like the true mobility there. Look at that, that's pretty significantly restricted. She's actually like a grade three that's compensating to a grade two right? She can lift up higher to like a grade two, but she's actually like less than 50% maybe. But look afterward, I'm holding down uh, the floor of her mouth. Boom, she's a grade one. So she's actually gone from a three to a one after the release. And then here's with the, the sutures in. So we put sutures for adults or teenagers um, most of the time. Um, but anyway, way better, okay, mobility. So we treat the tongue mobility and then we see what we get. So easier with sounds, like ah, uh, singing is easier. Um, you can talk or sing louder. Um, the list comes and goes, she said, with her soreness, and, um, but it's temporary. Her myofunctional therapist, again, she, we don't do it unless she's working with the myofunctional therapist. 
um, due to pain, uh, hard to clean outside the bottom teeth, but her tongue can reach farther. So that's the only thing she had worse, but less neck tension, less TMJ issues, less mouth breathing, look at the sleep, less moving at night, less need of a sleep appliance, and less grinding teeth at night. So that's good. That's encouraging from a simple procedure that takes about 15 minutes. I mean, that's where the singing is easier, less jaw tension, posture is much improved, and less tension in the neck and shoulders. So do we just treat everyone that has a tongue tie or it looks like a tongue tie? No. And how can we help our pediatrician friends or our dental friends um, or other therapists figure out who needs this done? So we need some type of a screening tool that has to be quick and easy to implement. Otherwise, what's the point? Combine the symptoms, function, and then parent or patient desires. It should, of course, use, be useful and reliably predict-related issues. And then we never want to over-treat. We also don't want to under-treat. We want to try to get right on. So it should prevent treating if no issues. First step, we use the tongue range of motion ratio. So this is what I was talking about earlier with the grade 1 or grade 4. So grade 4 it means it's less than 25% when they lift up to the incisive papilla. So they're trying to open wide and lift up their tongue to touch behind the spot, the the, uh, or touch the spot, the part behind your uh, upper incisors, right? So if they can lift up over 80% of the way of their maximum opening, you can open, measure that, have them put tongue to spot, measure that. So, right, that's greater than 80%, that's grade one. Okay, they say it's above average. Grade two is 50 to 80%. So that's average, although lots of people that are average still have issues, okay? Grade three is less than 50% of the way, that's below average, it's like in the bottom 10%. And then um, below 25%, that's very below average, significantly below average. So uh, that's a problem. You can also look at the like posterior tongue mobility, so lingual palatal suction. This tongue range of motion ratio, the uh, lingual palatal suction. And there's an article that's free you can download from Dr. Zaghi that goes into more detail than we have time for today. But basically, they should be able to do a nice suction hold or cave and open pretty wide, so like about halfway of their maximum opening. Um, here's some more. Again, it's a functional assessment of tongue restriction, not just looking at it. Kotlow is more just where does it insert. This is more how high can they lift. Um, but again, watch for compensations of the floor of the mouth elevating, neck strain, and then also, like me, I have limited opening because I had jaw surgery. So again, have them lift up the tongue first, check it, and then also check it holding a glove finger. So that's the first step of the screening is the tongue range of motion ratio. How high can they lift up? So that's down here. Right, that's what you fill out. But this is the symptom part. So we have baby stuff, and then we have the child to adult stuff. This is the previous version of the TRQ, or Tongue Restriction Questionnaire. Um, you can download this in all of our forms at this uh, QR link right there, um, tongue tie al for alabama.com slash professionals. Um, but this is the old form. The new form I like because we're not going to treat it now if they just had issues as a baby. So we just want to look at the current issues, and then also how significantly does it impact quality of life. So if they have a few things on here, but it does not at all impact quality of life, then they probably won't want to do it because it's not worth it to them. There's no perceived need. But if they have just a few things on here and that's very significantly, even if it's like a grade two or maybe even a grade one, it's still probably worth a referral to the tongue tie center or a referral to the doctor of your choice in your area who's good with tongue ties, right? Um, which may not be the ENT, or it might be. It may or may not be the dentist in your area or a pediatric dentist. You have to find kind of your team in your area or geographic area, southeast or the northeast. Um, so we have patients come from all over the country, predominantly the southeast, like Florida, Georgia, obviously Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Um, we had someone from North Carolina this week. We had someone from um, Texas earlier so, uh, this week. So it kind of depends on the day, but... So here's the main uh, issues. You can read those if you want to and, or download the form. But it's kind of, the, again, the greatest hits of our 50-item questionnaire. This is about 15 or 20 items. And so basically it's just to um, stimulate a conversation between the parent and the provider, whether that's you or maybe a dentist or the pediatrician, and say, okay, they have several of these things, like they're grinding teeth and they're snoring, and, yeah, they have a speech delay, and he's hyper, he's all boy, and it's pretty significantly impacting quality of life, and his tongue is a grade three. Well, for me, we should definitely get that checked out. Sometimes it's a maybe. I don't know. Let's wait and see. Um, but if he has several issues or she has several issues that are significantly impacting quality of life and there is a tongue restriction, definitely get that checked out in more detail. We got this published in a dental journal uh, back in March 2021. Um, this basically talks about how it's very common to have these issues like snoring, picky eating, restless sleep, mouth breathing, but it's not normal. 
And then if you have a grade four, like you can barely lift your tongue up, it did not take many check marks on the form, about four, to say, yeah, you need to go to the tongue tie center to get this checked out. But conversely, if they have like excellent elevation, but they still had 10 symptoms on there, that also is probably worth getting checked out. A few uh, quotes from the article, babies with symptoms that are left untreated are more likely to have higher symptom counts as children. So highly significant and more likely to be referred as children for further assessment and treatment. So we have to screen and check babies appropriately for issues related to tongue ties if they're present. Treat as a baby, hopefully not have issues later on as a child or as an adult. Right, and that's uh, Walls 2014 is an article you can look up that talks about that too. Also, this is interesting. High percentage of patients, parents thought a referral would be helpful. 26% of our dental patients so this, I didn't go into this earlier, but this whole study was done with our dental patients, not with tongue tie patients. So 26% of our general population just coming to us for a, you know, to check their teeth thought, yeah, we should probably get my child's tongue checked out. So that's one in four. This is way more common than people realize. Most people say tongue tie is about four to 10% of kids. Even that would be one in 10 kids, right? Or one in 20 kids maybe. But this is actually, it's about one in four kids have symptoms and the appearance or the function of a tongue tie uh, when you check properly. Uh, so if you look at other studies like um, Marcusan in uh, Brazil, they said 32.5% of babies when you checked them for a posterior tongue tie had some posterior tongue um, issues, restrictions. Um, other people would say it's about 25 to 30%. So to be conservative, I say 25, 26% of patients probably need a tongue tie release. It could be higher than that. Um, so anyway, we have to check at, at well visits and hygiene visits. Um, we got to educate our providers. Speech issues. So trouble with alveolar sounds, velar sounds, interdental, palatal, like most sounds uh, can be impacted. Speech delay, trouble speaking clearly or quickly. Stuttering, they're often shy. It's even in the Bible, Mark 7:35. His ears were open, the string of his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Feeding issues. So it's very complex. Obviously, I don't have to tell you that, but uh, it's eight tongue muscles, six cranial nerves involved in chewing and swallowing. Often they'll gag on foods, pack foods, expelling, vomiting, swallowing whole, refusing foods, poor weight gain. We've already talked about this some. Um, picky eating, poor lip closures, like they're messy eaters, takes them forever, and they, they're still eating pouches like at age eight. You know, they can't consume an age appropriate diet. Um, so when we wrote the book Tongue Tied, oh, here's a copy. If you don't have one, pick one up. Uh, um, but basically, there is no each each section has like speech and then has some case studies, has like the research, feeding, uh, sleep stuff, and then the research feeding, and there was no research, like not even one article I could find connecting solid feeding and tongue ties. So Laura, and a speech therapist who was in our office, and I put this together. It's just five cases of posterior, so less obvious tongue tie, like there's nothing there, there's hardly anything there, right? We released it, and then they had significant improvements in speech, eating, and sleep afterward. You can download this for free, but basically it's it's like a spectrum uh, rather than a signal of disease state, so spectrum restriction. So what happens if you leave it? Well, if you leave it as a baby, they will likely, not always, but likely have issues later on with speech or trouble swallowing or underweight or airway issues or poor sleep quality, behavior, ADHD, teeth grinding, brain development. By the time, uh, so babies, their brain develop is at 1% a day. By the time they're age three, the brain is 80% the size of an adult brain. By the time they're age five, it's 90% the size of an adult brain. So the sooner we can help these kids get high quality sleep, the better of neurodevelopment they will have, right? Synaptogenesis, and they can clean out all the byproducts from the day, and they won't have ADHD because their brain's not on fire. Poor dental development, so high arch palate. They might have a tongue thrust, crowded teeth, and then reflux and even constipation, as we talked about before. So we had this uh, article, uh, Talk Tools uh, alumni here, uh, Robin, uh, helped us with this one too. Uh, so shout out to Robin. I think she's in this, um, this webinar as well. But prospective cohort study. So this is done at our office. We had about 50 kids, but it's so hard to get people to follow up at one week and one month for this study. So 37 um, that we could get them to follow up. Average age was four. So this is younger kids, uh, but age was between one and 12. Significantly better speech solid feeding and sleep at one week and one month follow-up visits. So previous to this, it was like Wallachia or Messner 2002. There was like nine kids done. It was very small sample sizes. It was not prospective. Some of them were, but most of them were not prospective. 
and they didn't look at the whole picture. So this is the first article looking at like the entire picture, speech, eating, and sleep, right? So we saw improvements in speech delay, picky eating, slow eating, choking, snoring, restless sleep, published in Clinical Pediatrics in September 2020, which is a decent journal. It's a good journal. And um, it's available. We paid so it can be open access. So anyone can download this. You can share it with your pediatrician friends or whoever, your dental friends. This is a real thing. It has real improvements if it's done properly. If you cut it halfway, it shouldn't work. It won't work. If you take out one tonsil, it won't work, right? Here's some of the tables from the article. You can pause it and look at these later if you want to or just get the article. But um, basically the way to look at these is 37 kids total, 18 of those 37 checked the box that said, my child has frustration with communication. 15 of those 18 improved. So like almost all of them, right? But what's this total improvements? 21. Well, that means there was 21 kids overall that saw less frustration with communication or three kids whose parents didn't even realize they had frustration until it was solved. Okay, it's so like speech delay, right? 16 kids had it. Eight improved of the speech delayed, but 13 overall means five kids had started saying new words and talking more, but the parents didn't even know like they should have been talking more. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, all these things uh, saw improvement, all the things from our form basically. Um, even like stuttering, right? Like stuttering says it was not significant, but because like two out of the four improved, that's still good for those two, but 10 overall saw less stuttering. The parents didn't realize it was connected to the tongue. Feeding improvements, um, frustration with eating, uh, like this is the key, like total improvements. So this is not zero for any of these categories. So that means at least some people saw some results in, you know, in feeding, right? Slow eating, grazing, packing foods, picky eating, choking or gagging on foods, spits out foods. How many kids do you have on your caseload right now that have these issues? Very often they're related to tongue ties. Sleep improvements. Again, this is a prospective cohort study. So before we knew if it was going to help at all, you're in the study, we're reporting the data. We're not going to cherry pick the data, right? So sleep improvements, like everyone saw some big sleep improvements, okay? That had issues with sleep, right? Lots and lots of things. So less sleep in weird positions, less restless sleeping, they're sleeping deeper, less wetting the bed. Ten of the kids had less, less wetting the bed, less teeth grinding, less mouth breathing, uh, less snoring, less gasping for air. So 89% had improved speech. 83% had improved solid feeding, 83% had improved sleep, 90% said, yeah, we'd do it again. Some people were like, eh, it's okay. And I think one person was like, no, we didn't get that much out of it. So that can happen, um, but combining with therapy, you get even better results. This is like just the release, just like a week or a month. So the kids that didn't see the improvements right away with the therapy, they should have even better results because we gave them the, mo the mobility, but it's that neuromuscular re-education, that $5 word, right? the neuromuscular re-education to relearn how their brain and their muscles seem to move together, that's when you get the results. So it cannot just be a clipper, a snip. So if you just cut it in the body of the tongue, not going to work. If you cut it incompletely, I don't even see where they cut on this one. It's not going to work, right? That's a full release. This patient's in braces, but they were clipped as a baby. If they just clip once in the lip or clip once with the tongue, it's not going to help that baby, right? You got to get the full release, get the whole thing out of there, okay? Please don't cut too low. Don't cut in the salivary ducts. That's not good. Unfortunately, we see it every day. So you can see this one's clipped. Look at how um, limited that mobility is of the tongue. Now it flips all the way back. You think, well, that's just as a baby. What's the big deal? Well, if it's clipped as a baby, it persists. This is not the same patient, obviously, but <laughs> this is a 30-year-old. Right? I was like in high school. I don't know. Um, or younger one. Uh, so this is not the same patient. But... If you leave it alone, it's not going to grow out. Right? It's, it's really tight, type 1 collagen. It's not going to stretch. It stretches less than 1%. So it doesn't stretch out. This patient, he's like, oh, yeah, mine was clipped as a baby. I was like, oh, my word. That's true tongue mobility. right? That's good. This one is very, very tight. Super thick. This one, they botched it pretty bad. They cut into the salivary ducts and gave them lots of openings. So how do you do it the right way? I'll show you. This is with the light scalpel CO2 laser. We hover over um, the papilla. It's just a few seconds and lots of tension. Slow hand speed. This is, again, the laser. The baby's awake. They're crying. And it's just about 15 seconds for the lip. So the tissue is not burning. It's vaporizing. So what's doing is the laser energy hits the water molecules in the cells. 
The water molecules are superheated to 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water, and it just vaporizes or turns to steam, water vapor. That's what's happening. A diode laser is about 100, sorry, 700 to 1,000 degrees Celsius and just burns the crap out of it. We used a diode laser for about 18 months. It works okay, but we had more post-op pain. The procedure was slower. I mean, look at that posterior tongue tie. It's about three seconds for the tongue, right, right in the middle. Um, so that's why we use the CO2 now. We've used it since 2016, but um, it works really well. I'm not paid by them to say that. It just, the tool works well. So most of the people that do this will probably invest in like a CO2 laser at some point. So this is done with a diode incorrectly. They use silver nitrate. We've never had to do that. We don't keep silver nitrate. Significant post-op pain, nursing strike, and then of course there's posts on Facebook for everyone to see. So it can be done incorrectly with the laser. I don't know who did this one, but that's, that's nasty. That's terrible. So please don't do that or um, help parents find good providers that you know that they're going to do a good job because not everyone who buys a laser is trained in it. We're trying to help with that with Tongue Tad Academy. Not everyone who has a pair of scissors or, or a laser, you know, does it right or some, some do it wrong. Um, but find those people in your community that you can trust. So here's a two-year-old. Again, they do not have to be put to sleep. We have patients that will drive from Wisconsin. Literally, someone drove from Wisconsin 24 hours each way because they want to do their two-year-old without putting them to sleep. Here's a two-year-old. We have mom and dad back holding hands. Laser safety glasses on everyone. Here says, and then here's the video of this one. I should have used the tooth chair because I got bit, but basically by the time they realize it's hurting, they are, we're done. So it's about 10 seconds, and then I got bit right there a little bit. But uh, yeah, but that kid had better speech, eating, and sleep afterward, two years old. Aftercare, so it heals rapidly by secondary intention. Mom can nurse right away, but just get milk in the baby however you can. It can look like an infection or pus because it's white or yellow color, but it's not. Often they have more drooling, Tylenol, and Motrin. Motrin if they're over six months. We dose it per pound, so it's a quarter ml per pound. Okay, um, skin to skin, ideally nursing. It's sore for just a couple days. It often takes about three weeks to relearn, but they'll often have some improvement the same day. And then I call everyone check to check on them, and they have my cell phone number. For uh, babies, uh, let me see. Okay, yeah, for babies uh, to prevent reattachment, you have to do exercises, or it will stick back together. We say just four times a day now. Um, for three weeks, quality over quantity, it's about five to 10 seconds. So we show the parents before they leave, we have them put on gloves and they do it too. So for the upper lip, just lift the whole diamond up, firm but gentle pressure like a rolling pin right on the wound. For the tongue, I like to hold the gum pad, hold the lower jaw with the non-dominant hand, push down with the index finger on the floor of the mouth, like into it and up. So just one finger, they can see it really well and they're pushing down first in the floor of the mouth and like into it and up. And you can do this too to help them out and check on it. If you see them get better and then it gets worse, it's probably the tongue sticking back together. So do a deeper stretch, stretch and put on it. Probably 90% of the patients have lost some degree of mobility at the one week follow up. We have to do a deeper stretch. So for kids, we have the parents stretch two times a day for three weeks, um, minimum one time a day if it's like a patient with autism that's very uncooperative, um, but minimum once a day. For best results, obviously work with a therapist, speech or myofunctional therapist. Um, so if they're older, you know, and can do myofunctional exercises, often it's twice a day, but it just depends on the therapist, whatever you guys recommend. That's your wheelhouse. I'm not going to, I'm going to stay in my lane here. Team approach. So lactation consultant, the dentist, the release provider, the orthodontist, speech therapist, OT, myofunctional, ENT, pediatrician, sleep physician, physical therapist, chiropractor, and others. I'm sure I'm leaving some out there, CST, you know, there's all kinds of people that can help, but the more team members, the better it will work, right? So a few case studies for you here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, but basically, this is a two-week-old male. Again, look at the form. So he falls asleep in the middle of the feeding, slides off on the nipple, hiccups a lot, passy falls out, uh, snoring, moves a lot in his sleep, he's always hungry, lip curls under, gassy, nose sounds congested, over an hour to feed him, He's just eating all the time, mom said. These are real patients. That's not my handwriting, obviously. Seven uh, out of 10 pain when he first latches. Gets better once he gets going, but that initial latch is like toe curling, right? Poor breast drainage, and then he prefers the left side, so we want to make sure they see a chiropractor. Look at that, to the tip. Now, I told you before, most of the time, if it's really bad pain, like toe curling pain, it's a less obvious tongue tie. This is one that kind of defied that rule, but about 90% of the time, it's a less obvious tongue tie and a lip tie. So pretty significant lip tie, lip lifts up better, 
See, just keep the release nice and conservative. This one we start right in the middle and then boom, look how much higher that tongue lifts up. So much better, much improved. Here's the, um, the after. So Passy stays in better a week later, more spitting up. That's because he's getting more milk, much less pain. It's like a four or three. Um, and then uh, lip doesn't curl under, deeper latch and less falling asleep. So she was happy. Here's a video of how we did that exact baby. Gonna laser safety glasses, suction. Um, the lip is about 15 seconds, lots of tension. And the laser is almost just nicking the tissue and then the tension is what's actually pulling it up like that, right? And then it lifts up much better. Look at that tongue, see how tight that is? Crazy tight. So we're gonna release that. I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit, here you go. So right in the middle and then it just disappears. So there's often minimal to no bleeding with the CO2 laser. Um, we're going to release that little bit of tissue there off the gum pad or also have a little p flap of tissue that's sitting there. So again, it has to be done properly or else you're not going to see the results. If you don't stretch, it'll stick back together. Like if you, you know, got your ear pierced but didn't wear the earring, it'll just close up. So uh, same kind of thing. This is the very next patient on that same day. Two-month-old male. This breaks my heart. Are you presently breastfeeding? No. How long since you stopped? One and a half months. So Mom tried for a couple of weeks, could not breastfeed, but turns out he's hard to bottle feed too. Pops off and on the nipple. He's gagging. Hiccups a lot. Gumming or chewing the nipple. Passy falls out easily. Short sleeping. They move a lot in their sleep. Always hungry. Clicking or smacking. Colic. Oh, that's terrible. Reflux. Gassy. Milk leaks out of the mouth. Nose sounds congested. And they're frustrated. Again, an hour to feed them. That's not normal. These people need help, but they ask their pediatrician and you know what? He's gaining weight, so it's fine. He will survive. We don't want them to survive or set the bar down here. We want them to thrive, right? Raise the bar. Look at that. To the tip, and no one picked it up. And mom gave up nursing, and she saw a lactation consultant, and like no one helped her. Super thick to the tip. Pretty good size lip tie, too. So we released the lip and the tongue. Came back uh, a week or so later. And uh, look at that, we're up like almost a pound, right? Almost a pound in a week. So that's really good weight gain. Less falling asleep, slides off the nipple less, less colic, again, that's a blessing. Less reflux, less clicking, less gassy, better weight gain, less hiccups, less gumming, sleeping longer, less snoring, less moving, nose less congested. Now this one didn't have it, but very often we do see babies, uh, uh, babies will babble more or even make new sounds, even at two months old. So people are like, oh, tongue ties don't impact speech. It's like, we see the babies that we do for feeding reasons have like crazy results with speech. And like this wasn't even on our form originally, if you look at some of the older forms, but um, we had so many parents come back saying, my baby's like talking all the time now, or just like new sounds and cooing and stuff. Um, that basically, uh, so we added it to the form. Anyway, here's the video on that same patient. So lifting up all the way, all the way, lots of tension. It's the same thing every time. Just get a full release, get all the restricted tissue. We use some numbing jelly first for the babies. Um, it's probably 90% numb, it's mostly numb. Here's the tongue. So right there in the middle, start right in the middle. Now we can see where we're going. We'll release all that tissue. Almost there, and then there's a little bit on the gum pad, so we'll get that too. And look at that tongue, it's so much better. So if you just clip it one time with scissors, you're not gonna get the whole thing. It's like if you had syndactyl, your fingers stuck together, they just did that, they just cut it part way. If it was on the hand though, you'd say, hey, plastic surgeon, you missed some of it, you didn't get the whole thing. Right, but in the mouth, if it's halfway, you don't notice it, so we need to get the full release. So you give the best mobility and the best chance of success. He's a three-month-old male. Again, lots of symptoms, um, like all these things. He does have poor weight gain, so he fell off the chart. He's in the third percentile, spits up every feeding. Passy falls out easily. Feels like a full-time job just to feed him. His nose is congested all the time from the milk refluxing back up in their nose. This is before we separated out the tongue tie and the lip tie symptoms. But crease, flattened, blanched nipples, lipstick-shaped nipples. Mom is triple feeding. That's a lot to ask. That's where they nurse and they pump and then give them a bottle afterward. And then by the time they do that, they have to start all over. Mom's had mastitis, so lots of issues. 
not obvious to the tip tongue tie. This one's probably like 60% maybe. Um, the lip is pretty good size and real like bulbous there at the bottom, but we released right here in the middle and then got that nice diamond shape afterward. And then afterward, baby gained much better. So again, 10 pounds, nine ounces, 10 pounds at three months. That's not good. Look at this, like a week or two later, I think it was like a week later, 11 pounds, six ounces. So we're up better than normal weight gain. So better than normal weight gain would be like 11.1, we're at 11.6. Um, deeper latch, less falling asleep, less reflux, less spitting up so they can keep more milk down and they're getting better weight gain. Less hiccups, less snoring, less moving, less frustrated, less pain, doesn't prefer one side and better breast drainage. Five month old, so hiccups a lot in utero, constant spitting up, passy falls out, but they are gaining weight. Bad pain, it's a seven out of 10 pain, so we're thinking probably a posterior or less obvious tongue tie. Sure enough, we look in there, there's almost nothing there. So I'm pulling back pretty good even to get that little string right there to pop up. The lip tie is significant, so they probably came in for the lip tie. I can't remember exactly, but I think they came in for the lip tie and then the tongue is actually what's causing a lot of the problems. So we release both. Deeper latch, less colic, less reflux, less clicking. One time spit up in the last two weeks. Used to be multiple times a day. Way less hiccups. Um, less pain for mom, it's a three instead of a seven now. She hates the stretches, but it's worth it, LOL. 12 month old, so it does not get better. Sometimes it does, but hurts bad. One year later, it's still a seven. Spits up every feeding, baby's frustrated, constantly eating, lip curls under, nipple distortion, nipple damage, like everything. Colic, reflux, clicking, like they checked off all, so many boxes and they're 12 months old, right? Let's look in there. I can see why it was missed because it's not obvious. It's maybe 25% uh, of the way. The lip tie is fairly obvious. We got a gap in the teeth now. So I think someone pointed out and she's like, oh my gosh, she's got a gap and then you got a lip tie and then they came to see us for the lip tie and then all these things. And then uh, they nursed afterwards. So the baby's still nursing. Mom was a trooper. She stuck up with seven out of 10 pain eight times a day for 365 days. That's dedication. That's impressive. Deeper latch, lip doesn't curl under, sleeping longer, less frustrated, less moving in her sleep, less nipple distortion, much less pain. It was a seven, now it's a one. Praise Jesus, that's wonderful. Now it's a one. And then um, better breast drainage, so. Here's a 14 month old. This is a patient we actually just saw uh, two days ago uh, for their follow up. Uh, so mom had to stop breastfeeding at three weeks, had torticollis, painful nursing, nipple shield, gassy, milk kick out of her mouth. Uh, she's a slow eater, grazes on food, picky eating, constipation, Miralax, broccoli and watermelon she has trouble with. Um, she uh, clicks when she uses a straw cup, tripod sleeping at night, trouble brushing the top teeth, trouble f eating food from a spoon, a gap, and then lots of ear infections, right? So we just saw them like a week later and then the follow-up was two days ago. Just wanna put a recent case in there. We, I could have make almost, most patients I can make into a case study and just put in here. Uh, look at that lip, super thick lip, the tongue is not obvious. I mean, to me, okay, it's pr fairly tight, but it's not obvious, right? It's not like to the tip. So we released it. It's about 10 seconds for the release. The lip is about, I don't know, 15 seconds. Came back on Monday and talking more, less moving at night, wakes up less tired, less frustration with eating, easier to eat, eating faster, eating more food, finishing meals better, less spitting out food, less constipation, easier to brush your teeth, and more cosmetic smile. So they were very happy for their 14 month old, had lots of improvements in just one week, right? Um, here's a 15 month old. Speech is pretty good, it's just some frustration maybe, but again, it's hard to tell sometimes these young kids like what's normal, what's not uh, for the parents. Um, but grazes on food, choking or gagging, some issues as a baby, tons of sleep issues for her, lots of lip tie issues and then ear tubes. She quote, doesn't sleep, tried a weighted blanket, she screams out at night like night terrors. Let's take a look, nothing obvious. So again, if I can show you these less obvious ones, you can imagine ones that are to the tip having as much or even a greater impact. So these less obvious ones could be on your caseload, okay? Lip tie is not terrible looking, but it is hard for her to brush and that kind of stuff and it's blanching the tissue. So we released it, boom, tongue lifts up much better, lip lifts up much better. A week later, trying new sounds now, woke up every two hours before, now she sleeps through the night at 15 months. She can see her teeth and she's smiling, it's easier to brush. She was crabby before, now she's relaxed and ready to play, much deeper sleep, 
sleeping deeper, less snoring, less gasping, less mouth breathing, and less tired. So awesome. Here's a two-year-old. Speech issues, eating issues, sleep issues. Sometimes it feels like Groundhog's Day at our office. Um, single words, he stopped progressing, is a speech delay, issues as a baby, leads to issues as a child, right? The baby is strong gag, hyper, he's all boy, hard to brush his top teeth, he sleeps horizontal, he shoves food in, he won't take a bite. Look at that, that's tight. So I mean, here's his tip. This is probably halfway back, probably 50%. His tongue lifts up much better after the release. The lip was fine. We don't just laser everyone's lip, right? If only if it needs it. His was okay. Came back a week later. Two words, says all done now. Talking louder. Trying new sounds. He says his alphabet faster. Less packing food in his cheeks. Less choking. Less strong gag reflex. Better attention span. Does every patient get this at a one week? No. Do most of them get it at some point within a few weeks? Yes. So this is just a, a cool case from a um, little while ago, but uh, less sleeping weird positions, sleeping deeper, wakes up less tired, less snoring, all those things. Here's a four-year-old, speech issues, eating issues, sleep issues, history of issues as a baby, went to a few lactation consultants, never caught it, leaves off the last half of words, mere lax for constipation, she's hyper, um, you catching a pattern yet? So they don't have to have all these things. They don't have to have a speech delay. They don't have to have articulation errors. Um, she did. They don't have, it's any combination. So they could have feeding and sleep, but not speech. They could have speech and sleep, but not feeding, right? Here's hers. Real thick, looks like an hourglass, okay? See that? So we release right here. Boom, lifts up much better. The lip was tight too, release the lip. A week later, Easier with L's and S's. Easier to communicate. Easier to understand by other people and parents. Actually finishing a meal now. Less frustration. Eating faster. Less spitting out foods. Less packing food in her cheeks. Eating faster. Eating more foods. So it's like less effort. It's easier to eat. Less moving around at night. Sleeping deeper. Less sleeping with the mouth open. Less snoring. Less gasping for air. Less headaches and migraines. Much less. Less mouth breathing and less constipation. Five-year-old. So no speech issues. They noticed, at least at first, speech is great. Feeding issues, sleep issues, it's like whack-a-mole, mashed potatoes and meat. That's not my handwriting, that's what they wrote before I even came in. It's often mashed potatoes and meat. Um, history of issues as a baby, notice the theme? Poor mouth breathing, ear tubes, not obvious tongue tie. If it could help her, the ones that are even more obvious, it could even you know help even more. Um, the lip was fine, nothing with the lip, it's okay. The teeth are together, they can keep the teeth clean, but that tongue is tight. We released it. Again, her speech was fine to begin with, but look at that. Eating faster, more food, finishing meals better, and sleeping deeper, uh, less, uh, waking up less tired, less grinding teeth, and less moving at night. Last case, a 13-year-old male. What did you say? Speech therapy for seven years. Everyone says, speak up. Dad understands about 70% of what he says, and he's 13 years old. Um, so he's getting frustrated. He's a slow eater. He's a picky eater with steak, so meat. Sleeps restlessly. He wakes up tired. He grinds his teeth. Cavities when he's younger. ADD, ADHD. He had such bad constipation. He had to go to the hospital for a few days. So we look in there. There is almost nothing under that tongue. There's a string, but it is not that tight. He fell and ripped his lip tie a little bit. Okay, we'll leave that. That's fine. So we said, hey, mom, there's a good chance it'll help with something. We just don't know what it is. Minimal risk, potentially high reward. Do you want to try it? We're not putting him to sleep, minimal risk. Sure, we want to try it. We'll try anything. He's been in speech therapy for seven years. Right? We had one kid who was 18 years old. He was a senior in high school. He'd been in speech therapy his whole school career, so for 12 years he's been in speech therapy. Still couldn't say R. It looked just like this kid. There was almost nothing there. We released it. He said R better before he even left the office. Right? They were from Georgia. So it's, it's pretty cool. So here's the diamond afterward. We did suture his up with a few uh, chromic gut sutures. One week later, easier to communicate. Parents and others understand it better. Easier with S's, less frustration. He ate a burger much faster. More food, finishing meals better, trying new foods. Sleep issues, less moving around at night, sleeping deeper, waking up less tired, less grinding his teeth. At 13 years old, and there's minimal restriction. So a few takeaways. Proper assessment and evaluation is critical. Symptoms and function are more important than appearance. Common does not mean normal. Screening must be conducted at hygiene and well-child visits or in the schools or somewhere. The sooner the problem is addressed and the more team members, the better it will work. 
And these tongue tie issues change over time and they can last a patient's whole life. And they really do place significant limitations on a patient and a family's quality of life. So if you want to reach out to us, you can, there's our phone number, um, there's our email. You can download the forms or the book Tongue Tied for free at our, um, here's the QR code for that one. If you do want to um, save on Tongue Tied Academy Lite, you can use the code TalkTools. It's real creative. It's just Talk Tools. Save $100 on Tongue Tied Academy Lite. We're not just making money off it. We donate the money. So we're trying to get the education out there. We've had a lot of therapists and others take it and say that they really appreciated it and it helped them deepen their knowledge about tongue ties. It's about 13 hours uh, for about $400. So anyway, um, I think we have some time for questions now. So if anyone uh, does want to stay on for questions, I'd be happy to answer those. And I uh, hope this talk was helpful.